You are listening to the Catholic Family Podcast, Lent Around the World, daily meditations chosen and read by traditional Catholics from around the globe. Hi, my name is Dan Nagley. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'll be reading you selections from Remember, Thoughts on the Passion of Our Lord, compiled and edited by Rev. F.X. Lassance. The Shadow of the Cross There is a painting which may be called the shadow of the cross. It represents a scene in the workshop of Nazareth. Joseph is employed at the carpenter's bench. Mary sits plying the distaff. A bright summer's day pours a flood of light into the room. Jesus, a beautiful youth with filial piety informing every feature, advances with outstretched arms towards his mother to embrace her and to imprint a kiss upon her cheek. Oh, what would this scene have been to Mary, with what joy would it have dilated her soul, if only the future had been concealed from her? But, alas, looking at Jesus, the mother's joy is turned into grief, because she sees that the loving attitude of her son casts the shadow of the cross on the opposite wall. What more touching, entrancing, than the scene enacted at Bethlehem? The winter winds were joyful with the music of the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and singing glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men of good will. The dismal cave was lighted up with the glory of heaven. Angels and wondering, adoring shepherds came to worship the newborn Savior, and Mary and Joseph lovingly, adoringly contemplated the heavenly babe. Had that scene, which has filled the earth for centuries with light and gladness, no joy for Mary, did not its splendor for the time being dispel the shadow of the cross? Did not Mary, in the words of Holy Scripture, rejoice because a man was born into the world, and for the moment turned the eye of her soul from the vision of Calvary? Alas, the joyous light of the Nativity only projected the shadow of the cross more distinctly upon Bethlehem. The scene in the stable, it is true, touched Mary's soul, caused rivers of love to well out of her heart, but only that the thought of Calvary might instantly change them into an ocean of bitterness. As Mary laid the divine infant in the manger, as she saw his little arms stretch out as if to embrace her, she thought of the time that the same Jesus would be laid upon the cross and nailed to it, when his arms would be stretched out in cruelest torture and infinite love to embrace the whole human race. As she listened to the song of the angels, she thought of the blasphemies with which men would demand his death. As she looked on the reverent shepherds, she thought of the wild beasts that would cry for his blood. As she looked on the glory of heaven, lighting that first opening of his eyes, she thought of the darkness that would fall upon their closing. As she saw earth and heaven rejoicing over his birth, she thought of how man and God would forsake him at death. As she clasped him to her bosom, she thought of the time when he would be laid at last, as you see him in his group of statuary, the Pieta, all bleeding and bruised, wounded and lifeless on her breast. Thus, even at Bethlehem, Mary stood in the shadow of the cross, and there, amid all the joy of that scene, was compelled to consecrate the winsome infant to the death of Calvary. Considering the intensity, bitterness, and duration of her sufferings in soul and body, the question arises, could mortal have made greater sacrifices, or have suffered more in behalf of any cause, than Mary made and suffered by consenting to give her son for the salvation of men? What did patriarch, or prophet, or apostle do for the salvation of men, in comparison with what Mary suffered for it? If those who, at Christ's invitation, abandon their nets and boats to follow him, shall hereafter sit on thrones and judge the world, what must be Mary's place in the kingdom of God, since she, in obedience to the divine will, to appropriate the words of St. Paul, spared not her own son, but delivered him up for us all? Let the redeemed learn, then, what they owe to Mary. Let them think of her more than thirty years martyrdom, in consequence of her maternal instincts leading her to desire that the chalice of suffering might pass from her divine Son, while her obedience to the divine counsels and her devotion to man's salvation, doing a holy violence to her love, forced her to say, Let the will of the Father be done. Let my Son suffer death to redeem his people from their sins. Let them look often and thoughtfully upon the scene at Mount Calvary. Let them meditate on Mary's holy heroism. Let them think of her as a mother wounded in her tenderest affections, as sorrowful unto death, yet tearless, 
unwavering in her purpose to fulfill the promise made to God through Gabriel, willing to drain the chalice of her affliction, calm when it came to making the sacrifice required for the redemption of the world, resolved to witness the end, to see Jesus blot out the handwriting against sinners with the most precious blood he had drawn from the fountains of her heart, to stand by the cross until she heard, It is finished until she saw her son become the savior of the world and the children of wrath become the children of god until jesus's lifeless body enfolded to her breast left her amid the shadows of calvary in a desolation so unutterable that earth has no name for its anguish let christians look upon mary crowned by jesus on calvary in the words of isaiah with the crown of tribulation and then they will understand why mary takes an interest in their spiritual welfare why she jealously guards the affair of their salvation in life, why she bends all her energies at the hour of death to protect souls from the assault of the demon. Then they will understand why that unfailing devotion to the cause of the world's redemption, which Mary displayed from Nazareth to Calvary, she now exhibits in behalf of each and every one of the redeemed, to the end that the precious blood of Jesus shall not have been shed for any soul in vain.